Hi, it's Cindy from the Osterville Library, and today we have something really exciting and is a uh, true part of Cape Cod history. And myself being a native Cape Codder, I always find this fascinating um, just to learn more about the history that we have here. So we are very privileged today to have Don Wilding. He is a historian, an author, a storyteller, and a scholar on all things Cape Cod and shipwrecks and um, has written many, many books that can be found on his website. And um, so we're going to talk about a couple things today, but we're going to start off talking about Henry Bestian's Cape Cod. Because um, I think now with all the different schooling methods that are going on and people trying to teach from home, there's a lot of great lessons in your book there that can help people learn about Cape Cod while going on field trips and experiencing things. Can you tell us some more about it? And welcome, too. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Um, yeah, with Best and, and the Outermost House, it's, uh, it's a book that's never, I never thought it got its due, really. Uh, people compare it to Thoreau's book and everything like that. Uh, for those who don't know the story of the Outermost House, uh, Bestin was a writer from Quincy who had been in the First World War as a uh, ambulance driver. And he came back from that experience uh, pretty traumatized, and it took a while. Uh, but eventually he was working for magazines. He had written some other books. He wrote a couple of books about the war. Uh, but all, you know, he had been in the heat of battle, you know, rescuing people uh, in the Battle of Verdun and some of the other battles in World War I. Uh, so he comes back, writes a few more books, and then he gets a magazine assignment that takes him out to Cape Cod. And that was about the Coast Guards of the Outer Beach. And he was fascinated by these men, especially since they were rescuing people, putting their own lives on the line uh, to rescue people who were in these shipwrecks off the coast of Cape Cod, because this was before the Cape Cod Canal. And so during that time, he becomes fascinated with the Outer Beach and finally has a house built out on the beach in East Ham. And it was only going to be a writing studio, but he stayed there for, you know, ends up staying there for a, while, a whole year, as he called it. Uh, but it was really, an, it was an enlightening experience to him and a healing experience from being in the war. So best in, you know, you can take that away from, from this whole thing, but also that the book, the, nat the natural observations were actually fuel for, uh, the case when the National Seashore was being established. When uh, the Park Service sent representatives to Cape Cod in the 1950s, they ended up quoting Beston's book more often <laughs> than you might realize in their reports. Uh, so that helped to sell the entire idea of a National Seashore to, to uh, Congress. And Beston was all for it. He loved the idea. And really, it's one of the, I always thought it was the most, The Outermost House was the definitive book about outer Cape Cod and living on the beach. So it's, yeah, the, the, the uh, observations about nature, there's a lot of history in there. He talks a lot about shipwrecks, uh, just among you know, and the people that lived in East Ham. I mean, East Ham at that time, there were only about 500 people living there. Um, so it was really very, you know, out in the middle of nowhere. Right. And a lot of people didn't understand why he'd want to do this in the first place. But uh, yeah, it's a great observation of the Outer Cape and it's not in the natural world there. Wow, that's incredible. Because I, I can't imagine being 500 people. I remember growing up, when we'd go from Osterville to Falmouth, it would take like 15 minutes and it wasn't a street light or anything the whole way mm. there. And if you went over the bridge, which was a major thing, you know, you'd pack a lunch, bring a blanket and notify two people that you were leaving the Cape. So, so it, it really has changed quite a bit since then. So you also write a lot about um, Cape Cod shipwrecks. And yes. you're in the process of putting a book together on that that should be coming out soon. Can you tell us some of that? Yeah, that's actually in the hands of uh, the History Press. It's called uh, Cape Cod Shipwrecks, uh, a uh, Stories of Tragedy and Triumph, or Triumph and Tragedy. I'm not even sure at this point. <laughs> uh, but we're, um, 
it is in the hand, their hands. It's in production right now. Uh, I think they're looking at a release of maybe early in 2021 at this point. Uh, I thought it was being held up due to COVID. They assured me it's not. So it's, uh, uh, it's on its way. Uh, this book will highlight a lot of shipwrecks that happened on the Outer Cape uh, that maybe people don't know the stories behind because that, or even know about because way back when, I mean, everybody knows the stories of, or most people knows the stories of maybe the Witta or um, uh, the Pendleton. Uh, there's, I mean, there's whole museums and other movements dedicated to this. Uh, I don't really focus too much on those. I've, I've gotten in more into some of the other shipwrecks that have occurred because um, going back on Cape Cod shipwrecks, it, there were between somewhere between 3,000 and 4,000 shipwrecks just between the time of the, the wreck of the Sparrowhawk in 1626 in Orleans and say the mid 20th century, you know, maybe up to the wreck of the, El, you know, the stranding of the Aldea in Orleans in 1984. So mm -hmm. uh, during that whole time, you have all these strandings and this usually involved either the Coast Guard or its predecessor, the U.S. Life Saving Service um, from 1872 onward until the Coast Guard, it was merged into the Coast Guard uh, in 1915. So there were thousands of men that were, people that were rescued off of these ships that stranded off of the outer bar. Uh, and people ask me a lot, why did this happen? Why were all these shipwrecks? Well, that's a treacherous area to navigate, uh, particularly in those days when all you had were these sailing ships. And uh, it, was, it was very hard to get around. I mean, the, the Mayflower was almost a casualty uh, right off of Monomoy in Pollock Rip area. Uh, so it's during that whole time, you had all these shipwrecks and there was no Cape Cod Canal to go through. So you know, it, it added up after a while and they had to do something. And there was a lot of heroics that happened uh, during these rescues. Um, and a lot of times, not only did the people on board these, these vessels meet their end, so did some of the rescuers uh, from the life-saving service. And, uh, you know, very, very dangerous job, not well paid either. Well, um, I can't imagine back then because one, you, as you say, they're sailing ships. Two, it's not like... You know, we had satellites to know where everybody was and GPS and, you know, nine, all these 911s, you could call the Coast Guard and they could come out or there'd be 10 Not other people in boats. I mean, it's amazing that people could even know that they were there to be rescued. Um, I mean, the best way they could signal each other was with a, a lantern, maybe. Wow. Uh, that was, and, and the, the Life Saving Service and the Coast Guard would send men out on patrol each night. There were, at one point, 13 Life Saving Service stations along the outer beach from uh, Wood End in Provincetown all the way down to Monomoy Island. Wow. So uh, so like uh, you had them at Nauset, you had it at uh, uh, Cahoon Hollow, which is now the beachcomber. Uh, so it's uh, these, these stations were everywhere and they would send somebody out every few hours at night uh, with a lantern and these surfmen, as they called them, would go up and down the beach and just keep an eye out for anything, any ship in distress, and particularly on stormy nights when it was very dangerous. And, you know, you, you don't have a lot of space to walk out there either uh, on the beach between the cliff and the water coming in on the beach. Sometimes there was no beach during a storm, so they'd have to do it from up on the cliff, and that was even harder. Uh, but they would, they had a phone line too that they would often communicate with uh, to uh, their st respective stations. And they would also use lanterns. Sometimes they would be able to signal the people on the ships, uh, let them know help was coming. But a lot of times it was too late. And other times, yeah, they'd be able to get to them. They would have two rescue techniques. There would be, they would either use a surfboat if they could navigate the waves, which wasn't always possible. The other way was a breeches buoy, which kind of was a zip line between the, uh, 
the ship in distress and the shore. And this was utilized by shooting a projectile from a small cannon called a wild gun. And they would shoot it at us sometimes four or 500 yards out into the surf, onto the ship, connect the two, and then they would be zipped along this line individually to shore. Uh, and amazing. a lot of times didn't work. So, but most of the time it did. Well, you have to have good aim, I would think. Yes, you then uh, they had to do several attempts and you had to do it quickly. Yeah. And if you didn't do it quickly in your drills, you were out of a job. So <laughs> you had to do it, I think it was within five minutes or something. Wow. Uh, get everything right. So it now, was, with, uh, sorry. no, go ahead. With all these shipwrecks around the Cape, now, is there lots of like buried treasures? I know when I used to dive, there was a couple of dive spots in the bay that, you know, were fun, popular, but are there any like major treasures out there? Uh, treasures, maybe. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's a, there's a lot of speculation. I know they've been checking out the wreck of a Portland uh, now there it was that was rumored to have had uh, quite a bit of uh, diamonds or treasure or whatever in its safe, uh, and and they were supposed to be doing that this week uh, or with within the last couple of weeks. Uh, so they've uh, yeah they would do that. Uh, some of the other ships they didn't. Some of them had a lot of one of one shipwreck. I rem I can't remember exactly which one. But it was uh, had a lot of tin on board, which a lot of people would go and find and keep for themselves, uh, which made them some money. Uh, but yeah, every now and then you find things in the sand, but usually it's just the timbers. Now, uh, a lot of times when you had the shipwrecks, people in town would be very quick to go out there and strip it clean. You know, they, they whether it was food or or supplies of any kind. Uh, so there wasn't usually too much left. Sometimes it was even booze in the case of the NEL Spindler in Provincetown. Uh, they, would, they, they actually pulled a couple of hundred cases of uh, whiskey off the ship before the Coast Guard got there. So people were very quick and word got around uh, on, the, on the Outer Cape, even though you, know, you figure out how do they do it, but it happened. So how can people find out more about your books? Well, um, at my website, dwcapecod.com, uh, uh, that'll have all the updates of everything going on. And there's also links to my Facebook and Twitter uh, accounts, Instagram, LinkedIn, all that. Uh, so I keep, I keep the updates coming on there. Uh, normally, I'd be out lecturing, uh, but uh, this year has been very, very different. Uh, and also I've led walks uh, about shipwrecks. So uh, whenever we resume those, uh, that the news of, will, uh, news of that will be on my website as well. That's great, because as I say, I think your books have so much value right now, especially during this hybrid school time that those days where kids aren't in school, I think it's a great resource to learn about the history of the Cape and the shipwrecks and what caused them and that. So I think it's, um, Great, and I look forward to hearing when those walks are. I'd love to, even if just, we do a Veterans Day walk here and visit the monuments, but um, I'd love to maybe see if we could do one here, you know, because socially distanced outside, could figure something out, maybe. <laughs> but thank you so much. Is there anything else you'd like to add today? Uh, no, uh, I just, you know, hopefully we'll all be able to get back out and, uh, you know, talk about this in person. It's right. it's always works really well that way. So, um, yep, I'm hoping to see everybody, you know, again real soon. Yeah, me too. So <laughs> I thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you.